Hello, I'm Randy Bennett of Educational Testing Service, a member of the Forum for World Education Steering Committee. The Forum for World Education, FWE, is a nonprofit that aims to provide an inclusive setting for business and education thought leaders to help transform education systems so that they better equip individuals with the knowledge, skills, and mindset for success in the challenging and rapidly changing world. Today's webinar is the third in a three-part series called Lessons from the COVID-19 Pandemic on ways to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of education systems. Today's topic is Lessons from the U.S. Experience for Building a More Effective and Resilient Education Ecosystem for the Future. I'm honored to introduce our moderator, Dr. Ellen Meyer, who is Professor of Computing and Educational Practice as well as director of the Center for Technology and School Change at Teachers College, Columbia University in New York City. Dr. Meyer co-chairs the Technology Policy and Practices Council for the New York Board of Regents and serves as co-editor for the CITE Journal. I'll turn it to Dr. Meyer, who will introduce today's distinguished panelists. Dr. Meyer. Good morning, everyone. We are uh, looking forward to discussing oppressing issues this morning for schools in the US and really schools around the world. The impact of COVID on our students and what educators at every level, teachers, building and district leaders and policymakers should do to address the instructional loss our students have experienced over the last two plus years. Everyone has suffered through the pandemic in a variety of ways, but schools were one of the institutions most severely impacted as the highly infectious COVID virus raced through buildings, particularly before vaccines were available, endangering the very lives of teachers, administrators, students, and their parents. In this unprecedented situation, and particularly in our large urban centers where COVID was most deadly, there seem to be only a few solutions. Keep students at home and start working with them remotely or design some sort of hybrid learning where teachers could work with students for some part of the time face-to-face -face, and then have them work independently or independently online in a class or part of a class. But the preparation for teaching remotely varied a great deal. The center I direct at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Center for Technology and School Change, was working with several schools and many teachers throughout the pandemic in two large urban areas in the Northeast. We found three concentric circles of need. First, teachers and students needed access to digital tools, to the internet, and to appropriate software. Students attending underserved schools did not always have access to these tools, and they often did not have dependable internet at home. One of my staff members was getting a ride home from um, a school, and her cab driver said he was quite desperate because he had only a cell phone that had internet connection and didn't know what his daughter was going to do when she had to use, uh, needed a computer for communicating with the school. Teachers and students in a, a second tier, if you will, also need to become comfortable and fluent with these tools. They need to be um, very um, easy in working with the software and hardware. Um, and once that fluency has been established, the third tier is really learning to use the tools to um, design impactful lessons for student learning. And that of course is the most challenging of all. As the vaccine took hold and schools became a bit safer, schools opened, but often intermittently, closing again when a new virus variant appeared. In the Northeast, students did start coming back to school, but the break in face-to-face -face school routines took their toll on everyone in the school community. Today, we're gonna to talk about the impact on student academic growth and what we can do about these findings and what teachers need by way of professional development. I'm excited to say that today you are talking to the very researchers who are providing the cutting edge data about instructional loss and what is needed going forward. Dr. Dr. Matt Dawson, sorry Matt, from Curriculum Associates will start us off. He's going to present some very interesting findings from national test data that he has analyzed 
And Matt will be followed by a presentation from Dr. Karen Lewis, Senior Research Scientist at the Center for School and Student Progress at NWEA. She's going to be discussing who has been most impacted and something everyone should be interested in learning about, more about, what will it take to recover? Karen will be followed by a presentation by Dr. Fanat Eklog, Director of Monitoring, Evaluation, and Research at the Institute for Student Achievement. She asks, how can we support teacher professional learning, well-being, and resilience during one of the most globally trying times any of us can remember? All great questions and exciting information. Some things for you to think about as you listen to our presenters. What is instructional loss and how are we defining it? How is framing it as instructional loss different from the more commonly used phrase learning loss? What are the primary issues and concerns for a range of students in the US? What should we do to address their learning needs now? What takeaways may be appropriate for educators from other countries attending this webinar? What factors influence the instructional loss? Some factors stood out, inequitable access to technology tools, computers, internet, professional development. For those of you who are teachers and school administrators, what barriers did you face? And finally, how were teachers prepared to design lessons and projects that could be enacted online while addressing the standards and learning goals for their students? What should we be doing now to prepare teachers for these situations? Without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Matt Dawson, who will start our panel presentations. Dr. Dawson is the Senior Director of Efficacy and Implementation Research at Curriculum Associates. In this role, Dr. Dawson is responsible for rigorously evaluating the impact of Curriculum Associates educational programs and understanding why they work, for whom, and under what conditions. Matt has been doing educational research for more than 20 years, and his experience includes more than 10 years at the Institute of Education Sciences-funded Regional Education Laboratory Midwest, where he served as director. Matt holds a PhD in human development and family science with a specialization in education evaluation from Ohio State University. Please, Matt, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Meyer. Appreciate the introduction, and I'm really excited to be here, and I look forward to um, talking with everyone. So um, the presentation I'm going to talk to you about summarizes findings across a couple of different studies. Um, a link to the reports that are underlying this presentation, as well as some other studies about learning during COVID, will be provided at the end of this presentation. The data for this work were collected using the iReady Diagnostic Assessment, which is an online adaptive, vertically scaled interim cognitive assessment that gives an overall score in both math and reading, as well as scores in different domains. The math domains include numbers and operations, algebra and algebraic thinking, geometry and measurement and data, while the reading domains are phonological awareness, phonics, high frequency words, comprehension in both literature and informational texts and vocabulary. We report scale scores, norm percentiles, and criterion reference grade level placements, which were determined through a standard setting process with educators. The criterion reference placements describe student performance relative to college and career readiness standards, not a student scale score in relation to scores from a norm sample of other students in the same grade. In addition, when using the iReady diagnostic, the student's placement level is tied directly to instructional recommendations for that specific student. Another thing to note is that prior to the fall of 2020, an item asking students if they were taking their assessment in school was added to the assessment. In our work based on the 2020-21 school year, we only included students who reported testing in school in our work due to score inflation seen in scores from remote testers, especially in their early grades. We continue to focus on in-school data for the 21-22 school year, although right now about 93% of all test takers report testing in school. I will note that we did look at differences between in-school remote learners during COVID, but that is not the focus of this particular discussion. The main set of results is based on a longitudinal study examining the following research question. How did student growth during COVID differ from student growth prior to COVID? However, I will also briefly summarize findings on student performance based on criterion reference grade level placements so far this school year, or at least through, the, through March of 2022. For the longitudinal study, we used a three-level piecewise linear growth model controlling for race, ethnicity, neighborhood poverty, school locale, the number of weeks between each assessment, 
and a student's initial criterion reference placement. Our focus for this research question was rate of growth, not necessarily differences in scale scores or grade level placements. The sample for the study consisted of over 1.9 million students in reading and 2.3 million students in math. To be included in the sample, students had to have taken a valid diagnostic assessment across all testing windows as shown in the table. Students in the pre-COVID cohort were students who started in grades K through six in the fall of 2016 or 2017 and who were followed over three years. These students were not impacted by COVID with their last possible assessment take being taken in the fall of 2019, which was prior to COVID. Students in the COVID cohort were those who took the iReady diagnostic starting in the fall of 2019 and were also not in the pre-COVID cohort. That is, each group contains unique students. Students cannot be in both groups. The red highlighting in the table for spring one means that scores were not included, that these scores were not included in any models because of the large amount of missing data for the COVID cohort as a result of most students not being tested in the spring of 2020 due to COVID school closures. For the graphs on the following slides, there's a blue shaded area which represents the testing windows that were impacted during COVID. Further details on the demographic makeup of the sample are provided in the paper. Again, a link I'll, I'll provide at the end of the presentation. I will also note that we use school level demographic, economic and locale characteristics from the common core of data, not student level. The sample is not necessarily representative of US public, the US public school population as a whole. Um, it has a slightly higher percentage of students in urban schools, a slightly lower percentage of students in majority white schools and more schools in lower income neighborhoods compared to national averages. So what did we find? In general, we found the following. While the majority of students experienced some academic setbacks, the pandemic has not affected all students in the same way or to the same degree. Those that came into the pandemic most vulnerable to educational and resource inequities were at the greatest risk of not catching up to the unfinished learning experience during the pandemic. I will also note at this time that we believe that unfinished learning is a better description of learning during COVID than learning loss. Because of school closures, unequal access to technology and other factors that have interrupted learning, students have been able to get back all to all the learning that they needed to for the past couple of years. Some other findings. Students who were still learning to read and students who were moving from procedural to conceptual math problems tended to have larger losses. Students that were in school serving a higher proportion of black and Latino students and or were in schools in lower income neighborhoods showed slower growth. Students who were already two or more grades behind were consistently the most negatively impacted across all demographic groups, economic levels, or school locales. Finally, we saw the inequities in learning that existed for students of color and students in low income communities that were there long before the pandemic were maintained, if not exacerbated, by the conditions of education during the pandemic. So what does student growth look like? This graph shows student growth over time not just the mean differences in scores. I will note that I'm just gonna show growth from third grade to fifth grade as time does not permit showing additional grades. However, these patterns were fairly consistent across all grades. The score on the far left is the initial score for both cohorts. On average, students in third grade at the beginning of the pandemic lost ground in reading over, uh, sorry, lost ground in reading by the time they started the fifth grade in the fall of 2022. Note, that, note how the gap between the cohorts widened over time and students in the COVID cohort lost on average about four scale score points more than expected. To make up that gap during the fifth, their fifth grade school year, a student would have to gain at about a rate of 15% fa faster than expected over the course of fifth grade. Unfortunately, the students who were furthest behind before the pandemic seem to have lost the most, both, most, both in relation to their pre-pandemic peers, as well as their more well-performing classmates. The green lines represent students who were on or above grade level before the pandemic. The yellow lines represent students who are performing one grade below their chronological grade, and the red lines are students that started two or more grades below. You can see that the difference between the pre-COVID and the COVID groups for each placement category represented by these bars here. While that difference is important, it's also important to note the blue dotted line across the top of the graph representing the minimum score in order to be proficient in reading by the end of fifth grade. So remember these scores here are the fall, starting the fall of fifth grade this past fall 2021. The students who are two or more grades below in the COVID group were already pretty far behind prior to COVID. 
This distance right here represents four times the normal amount of growth expected in a given year by a student at this particular placement level. Again, while this slide only shows the progression of students from third grade to the start of fifth grade, the pattern was similar across all grades. The story in math was similar to that of reading, although it's easier to see the loss due to the initial school closures during the first spring of COVID, which is basically this, I'm sorry for the thing, this area right here. And then the con continued struggles over the course of the 2021 school year. On average, most students lost ground in mathematics and the losses were larger in math than they were in reading across all grades. The overall gap increased by about 10 points. In order to make up that difference in one school year, a student would have to gain at a rate of about 50% faster than expected during a regular fall to spring in fifth grade. As a reminder, the green lines represent students who were on or above grade level before the pandemic. The yellow lines represent students who were forming one grade below their chronological grade, and the red lines are students that started two or more grades below. Again, there are clear differences between the pre-COVID cohort and the COVID cohort to start the fall of, start school in the fall of 2021. But as with reading, while students across all placements struggled in mathematics during the pandemic, the kids that were furthest behind seemed to struggle the most, as was the case in reading. Almost all students lost ground, have lost ground to make up in math, but those that were furthest behind before COVID fell further behind during COVID to start the 2021 school year. To get to proficiency, this student would have to grow almost three times their normal rate over the course of one school year. Given what growth looked like during the 2021 school year, what are we seeing so far this year? While using a little bit different methodology and a different sample, I'm going to present these results to show how students are performing in terms of their grade level placements this school year through the winter of 2022 compared to the winter of 2021, as well as pre-COVID historical norms. Just to kind of set the stage, I want to orient you to how we're, look, we're going to look at the data presented in the next couple of slides. Graphs with the green bars represent students who are ready for grade level content. These are students who placed early on grade level or above on the iReady diagnostic. They range from possibly still benefiting from additional grade level work to being above grade level. Graphs with the red bars represent students who are not yet ready for grade level content. These are students who placed two or more grade levels below in the, on the iReady diagnostic. In both the red and green graphs, the gray bars represent the historical average, which is a roll up average of multiple school years prior to COVID in the same schools as the students that are represented in the, in the green or red bars. Unsurprising, surprisingly, the conclusions based on these data follow the same pattern as seen in the growth data. For example, in reading, fewer students are on grade level in early grades compared to historical averages. Students in the upper elementary and middle school grades are, are getting closer to pre-pandemic levels. In mathematics, fewer students are on grade level compared to historical winter averages in, in nearly all grades. And in general, fewer students in schools serving mostly Black and Latino students or in schools in lower income zip codes are on grade level compared to schools serving mostly white students and or schools in higher income zip codes. In reading, in general, the percentage of students who are performing at or above grade level in the winter of 2022 was the same as represented by these yellow dots or higher, which represented by these green checks, compared to the winter of 2021, which is these middle bars, which was the winter during COVID. But both of these are still below historical name norms across all grades. Note the difference compared to historical norms is much larger in the early elementary grades. We are gonna see if we don't have the data yet, but we'll see if this pattern holds this spring. In math, in general, across all grades, the percentage of students performing at or above grade level has increased since last winter, as represented by these green checks. But these are still well below historical norms represented in these gray bars. Again, we are hopeful these gains continue for this group of students, and we'll see when we get our when we get the final set of spring data in the next couple of months. But while the percentage of students ready who are already on grade level is slowly increasing, the percentage of students performing two or more grades below has stayed the same compared to when compared to last winter. And there are still a larger number of students performing two or more grades below historical norms. As we saw in the previous graphs early about, earlier about growth, 
students who are performing two or more grades below tended to see slower growth in COVID. And there continues to be a higher percentage of students two or more grades below grade level in reading than before COVID. So these red bars are still further. There's a lot, there's more kids, high, high percentage of kids in these two or more grades below compared to the gray bars, which are the historical norms in reading. In math, the pattern is similar for students performing two or more grades below. And though there seems to be some improvement in a few early grades, these percentages are still much higher than historical norms. That is, while there seems to be some slight improvement in some grades, there's still a long way to go. So some final thoughts on what we see in our data and what we are hearing from educators. First, getting back to normal isn't good enough. We need to accelerate student learning, not simply match prior growth rates. The impact that, that we saw was not the same for all students. While almost all students struggled, those furthest behind and who had the strongest headwinds consistently lost the most ground. A long, taking a long-term view is critical. Getting kids who are performing two or more grades below grade level to on grade level proficiency does not happen in one year. Small additions and acceleration compounding over time can make a huge difference over multiple years. And finally, one size does not fit all. There are no silver bullets. Fortunately, given the data that many educators now have access to, we have more insight into what students, where students are struggling and using those data to create targeted action plans is critical to success. And finally, this we did some additional work on unfinished learning. This is a, just a sample of a couple um, other studies, and there's a link at the bottom um, where you can go directly to this page and, and look at the, in more detail at these papers if you're still interested. So thanks for your time, and I appreciate um, you listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. Uh, great presentation. So much data you have packed into those few slides. Um, I am sure people would like to spend a lot more time uh, with you. My apologies. I'm sure people would spend, like to spend a lot more time with you going through um, some of the details, I'm breaking it down even further. Um, I would like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Karen Lewis, um, who is a senior research scientist at the, with the Center for School and Student Progress at NWEA. Uh, she's going to be talking to us now about what has been uh, most, and who has been rather, most impacted and what it's going to take to recover, a question we all want to know much more about. Uh, Karen is a senior research scientist at NWEA. Dr. Lewis co-leads NWEA's ongoing research on the impacts of COVID-19 on student achievement and growth. Her research interests focus on the interplay between students' academic growth and achievement, their social emotional development, which we need to hear about, of course, and well-being, and how they experienced their school's climate. Prior to joining NWEA, she was a senior researcher at Education Northwest, where she led a diverse portfolio of applied research, technical assistance, and evaluation projects centered around social and emotional learning. Dr. Lewis is a former data fellow with the Strategic Data Project at Harvard Center for Education Policy and Research. She completed a National Science Foundation funded postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Colorado Boulder and earned a PhD from the University of Oregon in social psychology with a concentration in quantitative methods. Dr. Lewis, welcome. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you for that kind introduction and good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. Um, I have the unfortunate position of following Matt, who's already shared some really, um, some really concerning data about the impacts of the pandemic thus far. And I am going to do something similar. I'm gonna give you um, some highlights of what we're finding in our research. But I think what really brings us all together today is not just to admire the problem, but to really be more forward thinking and start to be intentional about how we help students recover from this. So in addition to talking about what we're seeing in our data about who has been most impacted, I'm also gonna talk about what we think is gonna be necessary to help kids catch up and some work we have underway that helps us to understand how best to help students recover. So as Ellen mentioned, I am a senior research scientist at NWA. We are an organization similar to Curriculum Associates in that we offer an interim assessment and have been able to use the data our partners are collecting on student achievement 
to understand and monitor student progress across the COVID-19 pandemic. And today to set the table, I wanna help understand and ask the question, what is the magnitude of unfinished learning at the start of this third school year that's been impacted by COVID-19? Um, about our assessment, as I've already mentioned, it's an interim assessment. It's used in roughly a quarter of public schools across the country. So we have a large database to draw from to understand student achievement trends over the last two years. Um, as most interim assessments, it is computer adaptive and grade level independent, which of course is becoming increasingly important in this moment because we're able to capture student achievement well above or well below grade level. And the data I want to talk about today, we have a sample of about 5 million students in grades three through eight. And these are drawn from over 12,000 public schools across the country, representing about 48 states. Our assessment uses a, a score called the RIT score, which is rather arbitrary um, if you're not a part of the initiated like I am and think about RIT scores on a daily basis. But I'm going to help you understand trends across time by showing you differences in those average scores across the last three falls. So on this graph I'm about to show you, we're gonna look at math scores first. And on the vertical axis, we'll be looking at average scale scores. Remember this is a uh, vertical scale, it's grade level independent. So I can compare across grades on this same scale. Starting back in fall of 2019, we can think of this as our baseline. This is where average achievement was sitting for these particular groups of schools back in the fall of 2019. And these different dots represent the averages across the grades in our study. We can use some lines to plot what we're seeing as students re-entered the classroom in fall of 2020. Now, these are cross-sectional comparisons, for instance, looking at average third grade achievement in fall of 2020 relative to average third grade achievement back in fall of 2019. The numbers that are sitting above those dots in fall of 2020, those are telling us about the achievement declines we see between those two groups of students. And this is put into a standardized metric to help us understand and compare across studies and across time. So we're seeing already in the fall of 2020 when students re-entered the classroom after those initial spring shutdowns, we were seeing evidence that their math achievement was lower compared to historic averages. We can extend these lines out now to understand where students were in the fall of this school year, in the fall of 2021. Now these standardized effect sizes above those numbers, those are telling us about the cumulative achievement declines over these two years, because it's quantifying the differences in achievement in fall of 2021 and fall of 2019. So these are ranging from um, about 0.21 to about 0.27. So sitting at roughly a quarter of a standard deviation. A very fair question you might be asking yourself is, okay, a quarter of a standard deviation, is that bad? How bad is it? How do we make sense of this kind of magnitude? And one way to do that is to put it in the context of the kinds of achievement score gains we might expect from interventions in the education space trying to increase student achievement. And I think these guidelines developed by Matt Kraft are a helpful way to situate the gains versus the losses that we're seeing in our data. It is really challenging to impact achievement. And with that in mind, we really think about the types of effects we see and how large they are. If you were to tomorrow create a new math intervention and you were showed an effect that you raised student achievement by about a tenth of a standard deviation, you would be really excited. That would be a medium effect and you would have a good intervention on your hands. The impacts that we're seeing here, the achievement declines that are sitting at a roughly a quarter of a standard deviation, put them in this large category. I say this not to say that it's improbable to ever see large effects in education research, but it does mean that these are more rare and it's very, uh, it takes a lot of effort to see achievement increases of that magnitude. I wanna focus mostly on math in my presentation today, but I will um, quickly juxtapose what we see in math versus what we see in reading to paint the overall picture. And there's a couple of trends here that I want to point out to you. The first is the overall achievement declines we're seeing in the fall of this year in math are much larger, larger than what we see in reading, very consistent with what Matt has shared with us. And in many cases over double the achievement declines in math that we're seeing in reading. The other interesting trend that we've noticed is that if we look, about, look at the trends over time and how these achievement declines have accumulated, in math, it's been a progressive slowing of learning where we see um, that it was impacted in both fall of 2021 and fall of 2020. In reading, however, it was really the bright spot in the fall of 2020 was that reading achievement was holding steady and rather consistent with previous averages. It was over the course of the 2020-21 school year that that bright spot started to fade and we began to see reading has been impacted as well. 
Next, I wanna answer this question of who has been most impacted. And so I am gonna focus in on math to help us paint that picture, given that's where we see the largest impacts. And I wanna start by comparing the impacts for students in low versus high poverty schools. And we make this distinction between low versus high poverty based on publicly available information at the school level about the percentage of students in a school that are eligible for free or reduced price meals. So when I say a low poverty school, that's a school where 25% or fewer of students are eligible for that. Whereas in a high poverty school, 75% or more students are eligible for free or reduced price meals. So we're gonna look at achievement declines in low versus high poverty schools. And we're again, focusing in math. And we'll start by looking at what's happening in low poverty schools. And these graphs I'm about to show you, we call these our arrow plots. And there's several pieces of information captured here. So I wanna walk through it with you to make sure it's clear what I'm showing. The first thing you should know is this dotted line at zero, that represents the average achievement pre-pandemic. So again, we're back in standardized metric land. So we're standardizing against pre-pandemic achievement. So anytime you see the zero, keep that in mind that that's where the average was prior to the pandem pandemic back in fall of 2019. Now we're gonna layer in arrows that tell us about the achievement declines in each of the grades in our study. But let's hone in first on third grade and take just one example arrow to make sure it's clear what we're showing here. So at the base of the arrow, that circle, that's capturing pre-pandemic achievement for this particular group. So this is showing us where average achievement was for third graders in low poverty schools back in fall of 2019. The tip of the arrow is now situating average performance this fall for this group. So this is average achievement for third graders in low poverty schools in fall of 2021. And then the number at the base of the arrow, that's telling us about the achievement decline for this group over those two years. So between 2019 and 2021, we're seeing a decrease of 0.14 standard deviations for third graders in low poverty schools. We can zoom out now and look across all of the grades. And we see evidence of achievement declines for all of the grades of students in these low poverty schools. But notice again, we are kind of hinging this on pre-pandemic achievement overall at that zero point. So this was a high achieving group of kids well above national averages prior to the pandemic. This is still a well achieving group of kids during the pandemic sitting well above pre-pandemic averages, even in the context of these declines we've seen over the last two years. Now we'll fold in and compare what's happening for students in high poverty schools. Here too, we see evidence of achievement declines for all of the grades in our study. But if we compare the magnitude of those declines, they're obviously much larger for students in high poverty schools, particularly in the youngest grades. We also see that this was a group of kids in high poverty schools that were well below national averages prior to the pandemic. There were already pre-existing achievement gaps between low and high poverty schools. And given we see larger impacts of the pandemic for students in high poverty schools, we've only served to widen those gaps that already existed. Now, in addition to understanding how things compare between high and low poverty schools, I think it's also important to layer in what's happening by student race and ethnicity. And obviously school poverty and race ethnicity, they don't exist in isolation from one another. And I think it's really critical to consider them intersectionally to understand how kids outcomes might differ across these two contexts. So next, I want to compare uh, the achievement declines we're seeing by race and ethnicity, but break it out by low and high poverty schools. So first here, what you're seeing are these arrow plots now disaggregated by race and ethnicity, showing you differences for Asian, white, indigenous, Hispanic, and black students. Our indigenous category captures both Alaska Native and American Indian. So this panel is showing what's happening in low poverty schools. Notice we already had some pretty stark achievement gaps uh, by race and ethnicity in low poverty schools. In many cases, kids were above national averages, but not in all. We see Hispanic and black students were hovering those national averages and have sunk below them over the last two years. But now let's compare what's happening in low poverty schools to what's happening across these groups in high poverty schools. We've had to adjust the access, the vertical access to be able to capture what we're seeing here. Notice we had achievement gaps by race and ethnicity in high poverty schools as well. And we see larger magnitude of impacts for particularly Hispanic, Black, and Indigenous students. Notice that not only are those impacts quite large and larger than the overall averages, but these were students that were already sitting well below national averages prior to the pandemic. 
So the students who've been most impacted are also those to whom we owed the greatest educational debt before the pandemic even came on stage. Now, these are some pretty shocking and overwhelming numbers. We're getting close to a half of a standard deviation of declines, pushing, for instance, Black students almost a full standard deviation below pre-pandemic achievement. But I show you these not to um, suggest that these are intractable, but rather to give us a really a full and candid uh, view of what the scope of the pandemic has been so that we can respond with the urgency this moment requires. So now I want to transition and talk about how these effect sizes might compare to the kinds of effect size gains we can expect from some of the more popular interventions we're hearing about on the ground right now, which helps us to kind of start to ask that question, what will it take to recover? As Matt has already pointed out, this will not, this absolutely will not be a single year effort. We need to prepare for the long game, but we also need to think strategically and make sure we are matching student need to the kinds of supports and interventions that we are providing. We need to right size what we're doing for students. It's not so much asking, are we doing the right things? But importantly, are we doing enough of the right things to be able to meet students where they're at and get them back on track? So I want to just juxtapose the average test score declines that we're seeing here focusing in math. These are the average declines that we saw in elementary and middle school broken out given we see slightly larger impacts for elementary schools. And now we can compare the declines that we're seeing against the test score gains we might expect based on past research of some of the more popular interventions. My colleagues and I are part of what we call the Road to COVID Recovery Project which is a collaboration with researchers at Harvard and AIR, where we're working with over a dozen of our large district partners from across the country. They're giving us information about what they're doing in their schools to help students recover. We're merging that with their map growth data, their assessment data, to help do some rapid cycle research to try and understand what's working. And so as part of that project, we've been able to understand what are our partners doing it all seems to be focused on uh, the kinds of interventions and programs that help add back in some of that instructional time that's been lost over the last two years. So that's things like, um, I'm sure you've heard about high dosage tutoring. That's really popular in this moment as a uh, research-based strategy that can help get kids back on track. The other things we're hearing about are things like summer programming. So bringing kids in during the summer to extend their learning opportunities. The last intervention I'm gonna put here on these graphs is uh, a reduction in class size. This is a very popular idea in education that if there's fewer kids in the classroom, it should lead to better outcomes for students and they're getting more individualized in, uh, attention from their teacher. So in each of these cases, we can now layer in what research says about the efficacy of these strategies and how, how much we would expect in terms of test score gains relative to those test score declines that we've seen. What we see here is that, especially in elementary school students, we see that high dosage tutoring does have a really solid research base in impacting student achievement positively. And in this case, it's actually more than the average test score declines that we're seeing. Summer programming does have a solid research base as well, but the ki kinds of achievement gains that it's producing are certainly not uh, on order of magnitude of what we're seeing in terms of the losses. I think it's also really critical in looking at these graphs to keep in mind that these average test score declines are just that, they're averages. And as I showed you in those arrow plots, when we start to disaggregate and look under the hood about who's been most impacted, average is not going to be enough for many students. So we need to think deeply about layering, stacking these kinds of interventions so that we're actually targeting student need um, when we think about the package and the kind of wraparound services we're gonna provide to them to help them get back on track. So to quickly summarize, I've just shared a lot of information with you, but the key takeaways are this. We're seeing achievement declines over the last two years that are larger in math compared to reading. We've also seen that those achievement declines have accrued in different ways, whereas with math, it's been progressive. In reading, it's been really contained to that 2020-21 school year. High poverty schools have been hit harder. And as a result, we're seeing achievement gaps that already existed between low and high poverty schools widening by the order of 20% in math and 15% in reading. And lastly, when we start to think about what it's gonna to take to help students recover, high dosage, high dosage tutoring seems to be the best hope, but it's really important to think about how we can layer interventions on top of one another to provide the exact services students need. Because as Matt has already said, there is no silver bullet here and a one size fits all approach is absolutely not going to be sufficient. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, Karen. Wonderful. <clears throat> so much information. And I really appreciated the nuance with which you um, introduced some of the solutions. I think that uh, thinking deeply and uh, in complex ways is going to be very helpful to our students. Um, we have time for that. So we, um, you can uh, explore now. Uh, our next speaker, Dr. Fanat Eklog, is going to be talking about um, uh, staff development. Uh, she is the Director of Monitoring, Evaluation, and Research at the Institute for Student Achievement, and she's going to uh, present her research on teachers, per se. Um, Dr. Eklog is Director of Monitoring, Evaluation, um, a K-12 University Intermediary Organization and a Division of the Educational Testing Service, ETS. She partners, our ISA partners, with under-resourced and underserved schools and districts to provide teacher and leader coaching and other professional supports aimed at transforming school and uh, school work. Uh, Dr. Eklov, would you like to jump in, please? Yes, okay. Hope you can all see my screen. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Meyer, um, and hello, everyone. It really is a pleasure to be here with you at the uh, Forum for World Education. And as Dr. Meyer mentioned, I worked for the I work for the Institute for Student Achievement, or ISA. And today, what I want to discuss is what we at ISA or Institute for Student Achievement what we've been learning over the past two years of this, uh, of the COVID nineteen pandemic with respect to the needed supports. Um, for teacher learning and um, well-being. And so what we are finding in our work, um, which seems to track with uh, emerging national school and teacher survey data, is that um, there have been and there continues to be major impacts of the pandemic. Um, so not only on student academic performance as highlighted in Dr. Dawson's and Dr. Lewis's um, presentation, but also on uh, student social, emotional, mental well-being, um, the teacher workforce, the teacher working conditions, um, and more broadly, the teacher and learning environments um, in school. And we believe, and we're not alone in our beliefs, that these very, very complex set of challenges, if they are not adequately addressed, then it's highly unlikely that some of the strategies that are being put forth for addressing um, student unfinished learning, like you heard, such as high dosage tutoring and summer school, um, will be effective. Um, so very briefly, let me just go over, um, just provide you an overview of the Institute for Student Achievement, and, and just very briefly describe sort of how, as an organization, we were impacted uh, by the pandemic. Um, so ISA is a School Improvement Intermediary Organization it was established in 1990, and it became a division of the Educational Testing Services in 2013, um, and is often referred to internally at ETS as um, its practice division, in the sense that at ISA, we provide direct support and services to schools. And we have a, a mission and a mandate uh, to work uh, with schools that are underserved and under-resourced. Um, the schools that we work with are typically located in high poverty neighborhoods. They serve a student population that are majority Black and Latino with sizable uh, special ed and English uh, learners uh, student population as well. And um, these are the schools that largely remained in remote instruction during most of the 2021 school year. And these are the schools that serve students that have experienced uh, much higher rates of unfinished learning and instructional loss, um, the exact student population that Dr. Dawson and, and, and Dr. Lewis um, uh, noted in their presentations. And so we work with the adults in our partner schools, namely the teachers and students, uh, school leaders. Um, we uh, focus on in-service uh, teacher professional development, different forms. The, uh, the form that we tend to use most often is what was referred to as job embedded coaching, which really entails individual professional development for teachers and leaders. Um, and our coaches uh, do everything from classroom observations of instruction to debrief and feedback, goal setting, uh, processes for tracking progress, modeling teaching, 
co-teaching, provision of resources, et cetera. Now, in terms of how we as an organization were impacted by the pandemic, we, so prior to this pandemic, I say was very traditional and it's in the way we delivered professional development to teachers, we were 100% in person. Um, so starting in March, 2020, we had to make that immediate shift from on-site uh, to sort of virtual modes of delivery of our professional development services and required sort of major upskilling of our staff and our coaches. Um, and and uh, finally, from what we have been learning over the past two years, it's required us to make you know certain shifts in uh, not only in the modes of, of professional development that we provide, the delivery method, methods, but also in, in the focus area. And we're also seeing that there have been some differences and shifts that we've had to make from the 2021 school year to the current school year and what we'll be doing in, in upcoming school years. So just very briefly wanted to talk about our experiences uh, during the 2021 school year. Um, so again, as I mentioned, the, are the schools that we partner with remain largely remote in this time. Um, and so after providing about a year and a half of um, virtual coaching supports, uh, we really wanted to learn about and from teachers um, their experiences with the virtual coaching that we, we, we provided. And we did a series of teacher focus groups and administered a survey in spring of 2021. And so what we learned was that during this time, during the, the period of uh, largely remote uh, teaching and learning, um, the main focus of teachers' work with our ISD coaches was obviously on developing, rapidly developing, uh, supporting and building their capacity to integrate technology into their work. And the, the, the pie charts that we should have here are just some teacher reports from our survey on how they perceived the ICE coaching to impact these sort of various facets of uh, technology use. And um, I think about a third or so felt that working with their ISA coach increased considerably their, their comfort levels with technology. And it's not presented here, but um, it, it appears that the, the teachers who reported to have the lowest levels of technology comfort level, levels pre-pandemic you know, also reported having, you know, had, uh, having the ISA coaching, having, um, being more impactful in developing their technology skills. Um, then another area of focus was on improving student participation and engagement in the virtual classroom. One of the supports that our coaches had to, were, were working on with teachers was really re redefining what participation and engagement means. Um, in a uh, virtual classroom. So with the student population that we work with, these are students with limited or unreliable internet access that come from home environments that may not allow for, you know, camera on at all times, uh, from family backgrounds that were disproportionately affected by the actual pandemic themselves. Um, a lot of sort of equity um, concerns here. So just supporting teachers to really adjust their expectations for classroom behaviors and consequences. We found from our um, internal study that about two thirds of teachers sort of observed um, improvement of the student engagement in this uh, virtual environment. Um, and then the third was addressing uh, student social emotional development, really focusing on um, fostering sense of belonging and connectedness in, in the classroom in this virtual environment. Um, and part of that was helping teachers to locate and use instructional resources um, that are sort of related to real world issues, reflective of students' own um, uh, sociocultural backgrounds, and sort of the idea of integrating culturally responsive pedagogy in the uh, virtual environment. And we found that about a third of, of the teachers in our um, study reported observing improvements in social emotional well being students. Um, and so you can learn more about sort of what we found in our internal study. Um, we have three reports, and the link um, is, is provided right there. For you. So now I want to go to what we're learning about in, in, our, in the current year, the so-called transition year, when schools have you know, returned uh, to in-person learning um, and what we're seeing. And what we are seeing and learning from our, our partner schools is that in addition to this, uh, the crisis of unfinished learning among students in general and students um, that are sort of most disadvantaged in particular, 
there are challenges that are affecting the teacher working conditions um, or more broadly the teaching and learning environment in school. And so what we're seeing and learning, um, and which is uh, which emerging national data appears to be corroborating to a certain degree, is the following. Um, the first is about students. Young people are struggling, uh, not only academically, but just in terms of their well-being, their social and mental health. Um, we're seeing increased absenteeism. We're seeing disengagement. We're seeing increased disruptive behaviors. Um, discipline referrals, um, incidents of bullying, of violence, of course, unfinished um, learning, and any social, emotional, well being, and mental health challenges that existed you know, prior to the pandemic are now just exhausted. Um, among teachers, uh, we are seeing that the stress, the uncertainty of teaching in a pandemic during virtual teaching, during hybrid forums, now the return to in person, it really has taken its on educators. Um, we are seeing teacher shortages and staff shortages that existed before the pandemic are now uh, expanded, uh, particularly for teachers in the STEM field, teachers are of uh, special education, um, increased teacher absenteeism, uh, and these shortages have then have had the effect of increasing teachers' workload and work, uh, working hours it's decreased the amount of time that teachers have for planning, for collaborating with other teachers. Certain parts of the country and some of our schools, teachers are the targets of culture war, mask mandate, politics, vitriol. Um, we're seeing, you know, we're hearing from our teachers, uh, increased stress, anxiety, burnout, demoralization, um, which in turn is also having um, an impact on their own social emotional well-being and mental health uh, challenges. And so, um, you know, morale, morale, I guess, has fallen sharply. And we are worried that this will continue to get worse um, as the uh, challenges compound and build. So that's what we're seeing. And so we just want to sort of back up what we're finding, um, that these patterns, we're finding that it tracks from sort of emerging national data on teacher workforce and teaching. So what I'm sharing here is from the US Department of Education School Pulse Panel. So they are, they're conducting um, surveys on a monthly basis uh, to a sample of, I think, approximately 2,500 schools. It began in July 2021. And it's continuing, I think, through the end of this calendar year. And it's really focused on um, issues of, concerning the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on education. And so the data collection from January 2022 really focused specifically on teacher vacancies. So you can see here on the uh, bar, bar uh, graph on the left that this shows all public schools, schools that are high poverty, low poverty, high minority enrollment, and low moral enrollment, and how many are, are reporting um, teacher vacancies and the percent and the proportion of, uh, of teacher vacancies. And here you can see overall that 45% of public schools in the study are reporting that they have teaching positions that are vacant and that um, over or about one in five are reporting at least 5% of their teaching positions as being vacant. Um, and these teaching vacancies are more prevalent in the high poverty, high minority schools. Um, other findings from the study also were that the, the, the teacher uh, staff and staff vacancies are more prevalent among special education uh, teachers, that that vacancy rates are almost novel, um, other teaching areas. And in addition, it's not just teachers, um, custodial staff, transportation, um, and, and nutrition staff uh, are reported as being the highest vac vacancy, vacancies among non-teaching staff. And on the right, they, uh, the study also surveyed schools to understand um, what are the main reasons for teacher vacancies. And you can see that here, that half of the schools are reporting that it's really resignation um, are the main reasons for teaching staff vacancies, uh, whereas retirement um, really uh, is uh, about 20% of the reasons. Um, and then others are include um, 
newly created position. The other interesting data that, that emerged from the School Pulse panel, and this is data from the March 22, uh, or March uh, 2022 survey that really um, uh, looked at what, what staff members, and there's also a parent and a teacher component to it, but what staff members identified sort of as their major concern. So this is from March of this year. And these are just some of the, the top staff concerns. And you can see clearly that meeting student academic needs is of the greatest concern. Um, probably unsurprisingly, that 89% of schools reported this as a concern and 58% reported it as a you know, extreme concern. The following that, in addition to uh, concerns for uh, student academic needs is uh, concerns for their social, emotional, mental health needs, with over three quarters of the school supporting uh, that as a staff uh, concern. And then the remaining three concerns really pertain to the educators and the staff themselves. So the lack of substitute teachers, um, where nearly three quarters reported as an overall concern, and uh, uh, nearly half of schools uh, saying that it's of an extreme concern. Um, uh, staff and teacher physical health and safety, 70% of the schools reported that as a concern. And uh, teacher social, emotional, and mental health, um, about uh, uh, two, two thirds reported that as a, as a concern. And just as an FYI, the next set of findings from the School Pulse panel, which will be from um, April 2022, is going to have a specific focus on mental health issues um, and uh, social emotional issues in the schools. And then just one more sort of national survey data that seems to, that's you know, what we're observing seems to be sort of track. And this is really about teacher satisfaction and retention. Um, so this is findings of, of a report that was just released um, uh, from the Merrimack College Teacher Survey. Um, and uh, they sampled, or say they surveyed the teachers in January and February of this year. And I just wanted to highlight two interesting findings from, um, there are a lot of different, a lot of interesting findings from the survey, but I just wanted to highlight two here. One is about teacher set job satisfaction. Um, and so what, what they found currently, uh, at least as, as of January and February of this year, that only 12% of teachers in the study report being very satisfied with their jobs. And the line graph on the right, you can see that teacher job satisfaction you know, has been on the decline, but it's sort of hit a, an all-time low in 2022. The charts at the bottom pertain to retention. And, uh, teachers were asked the likelihood of them leaving the teaching profession altogether within the next two years. And here you can see that 44% of teachers in 2022 are saying that they are somewhat or very likely to leave the profession altogether. And you can see from the line graph on the right that the increase in the share of teachers um, reporting that they intend to leave uh, is, you know, has increased as well. So all of this to share that the issues that are facing schools and educators um, are very widespread and complex. And as a nonprofit focused on teacher learning and growth and hearing and seeing from teachers we work with, it's really the prevalence of burnout and the demoralization this year is sort of one of our major takeaways. And from that, ISA has identified sort of this urgent need to address teacher well-being um, and to plan and implement strategies to support teacher well-being and resilience. And you know, by no stretch of imagination are we alone in understanding the importance of teacher well-being. And you know, research very quickly, research has shown that teacher well-being is associated with their increased job satisfaction, higher commitment to the profession, lower burnout and attrition, um, greater efficacy or sense of efficacy um, in teaching. It improves the student-teacher relationship. Uh, uh, it's associated with positive school climate and their capacity, teachers' capacity to really embed uh, social emotional learning practices uh, in their classroom instruction. 
So, so knowing this, uh, we are at um, IFA are really sort of thinking about as a nonprofit in service teacher development support organization. So how do we how do we respond um, to this this crisis? So we have some ideas. These are just some examples of things that we are we're moving forward uh, uh, are going to be working on. And one is about really promoting educator well-being um, and adult uh, SEL. So one of the things that we are looking at is um, really the um, building our professional development and coaching strategies to really strengthen uh, teacher social emotional um, learning competencies and resilience. Um, then it, in addition to that, not just individual teachers, but really supporting schools to really build those structures and practices and climate that allows for the embedding of staff, not just student, but staff, um, uh, social, emotional, well-being, uh, development and support. And then the third is we've been doing sort of stu student-focused um, social, emotional learning and academic integration. So to expand that as well. And other areas are women of color education collaborative pilot initiative that we are focusing on leaders, women of color who are leaders. The women who are at the superintendent or assistant superintendent C or the principal to really implement, learn about and implement strategies that center their own physical, mental, social, emotional health and well-being, right? Um, to build their leadership skills for navigating the so-called new normal um, in schooling and education and to model what it means uh, to uh, adult self and well-being and strengthen leaders' capacity to design and implement school and district-wide policies and practices that promote educator and student um, social emotional uh, well-being. And the third is as an organization that the need to support schools to uh, collect data on, on, on school climate uh, to inform um, the ways in which they, they can make organizational and instructional decision making um, in support of not just student but educator well being as well. And that's it. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Fanat. Thank you so much <clears throat> for that. Uh, very thoughtful. Uh, for the thoughtful work you're doing on teachers and their well-being. Um, we always say that we can't get to the students without um, helping our teachers first. So it's a, a critical area. And uh, I've had the privilege of working with Dr. Fnott, um, or Dr. Fnott, Dr. Acklock, excuse me, um, and wanted to share with you, um, before she got to ISA, she had over two decades of experience in the monitoring, evaluation, and research of school reform initiatives in the US and internationally. Um, she, prior to joining ISA, she worked for the National Center for Restructuring Education, Schools, and Teaching at Teachers College, Columbia University, where she co founded its international division and secured multi year international school reform technical assistance contracts. And she holds an EDD in International and Comparative Education from Teachers College, Columbia University. So your research skills um, speak for your, your uh, great talent. Uh, Thank you so much. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Um, I wanted to start with you because I think ending on that parent note, we can, we can work backwards. And I wanna invite our audience to think about some of the many um, issues that we've talked about uh, this morning already and um, join in with your questions. Um, I'm going to ask some, I hope that the other panelists have some to ask of each other, perhaps, so we can have a good discussion, but we uh, seriously welcome the questions that you have. Um, so, Fanat, you talked about uh, the fact that you had to, um, when all of this, uh, when we started to feel um, the real issues, um, and realized that teachers are going to need a lot of professional development, that you needed to work with your staff um, to think about new skills um, that they might need in this situation, this online remote situation. Can you talk a little bit about what you did? Because it occurs to me that we can't get to the teachers without getting to the people who have to provide the help to this, the teachers. And I thought you would have some important things to say. Sure. 
So the first thing we did is we conducted an assessment of our staff and our coaches to really gauge their level of technology comfort level from everything from their knowledge of apps to actual integration. And what we found is that we could pretty much, we have approximately, I think we're at like 60 coaches or so. So we found that we could, you know, um, there was some coaches that were complete novices and some that were very skilled. Um, so we separated them into uh, two different groups and, gave, and provided rapid professional development for those coaches on everything from the apps, learning. Uh, oh, I also, I, I left out one thing. We did a scan and survey of what our schools have, what platforms they have, so we can you know, really tear, tailor the supports that we provided. And so that was the first step that we took. Um, it, it was bumpy, <laughs> especially with our novice, you know, our so-called novice uh, coaches. Um, but we did, and, and that's one of the reasons why we did that study after a year. We just wanted to see like how well we did. And we did, you know, relatively well. We definitely improved. Um, it did push ISA as an organization to rethink its, its professional development um, uh, mode of delivery, where, as I mentioned, it was very conservative, very in-person, um, on-site. Um, and so now we are, you know, offering sort of hybrid modes of, of support to teachers, right? So where our coaches are going to schools to do the classroom observations, but a lot of the debriefs can be online, right? So that the, the, um, the, the, the coach's time in the school is really concentrated on the types of supports that really require in-person, one-to-one type of, of relationship. So I hope that answers your question, but, but we're still, I mean, we're not done <laughs> by no stretch of imagination. And so we do have um, professional development for our staff and our coaches in general, right? So technology and technology integration has become a, a, a core focus of that as well. Yeah. In addition to like adult cell and everything else that, that we're working on. Right, right. It, because we have to go through the technology. In order we have to go through it, yes. Yeah. It, it both uh, frustrates and excites, right? There are things we can do and things that prevents us from doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the other, um, you mentioned something that really interested me and I think is so important as we go forward, which is um, that you're trying very hard to learn from and with the teachers as you go forward. Um, mm -hmm. With all the data you presented about the struggle, um, you know, how many of our teachers want to leave the profession, which breaks my heart. Um, how, what are, what are you learning and, and what do you think we need to be doing more of or less of as we, as we go forward? That's a huge question. <laughs> Some of it that's sort of outside of the purview of ISA, there are larger sort of policy solutions that are required to address, you know, some of the um, retention issues and obviously the staffing shortages, right? Um, so some of the policies that are, that are being put forth as sort of short-term solutions um, is really, first of all, that, that substitute teacher substitute pool needs to really be strengthened. That, that became abundantly clear last year and is abundantly clear this year. There is a lack of teacher substitutes. Um, and so some of the policies that I've seen that are being put forth is really tapping into the retired teacher pool to serve as, um, as substitute teachers. Um, other things are sort of, you know, with these shortages came a increase in teacher workloads and a decrease in the time that they had to plan, right? Teachers have planning time. They collaborate with teachers in their schools. All of that got reduced. And so it has to be, that has to be built back in, um, but can't be until you address the, the shortage, right? But clearly high quality um, and targeted um, professional development um, is, is, is required. One that allows teachers to have that planning time back if they, if they did, if they even had it to begin with. Um, what else? Um, well, what else are your teachers telling you maybe that, that they need besides the substitute teachers? The substitute teachers, the, again, planning time, restoration of planning time, um, ways to uh, address, uh, other ways to address or more targeted ways to really embed social, student social emotional learning into the academic core and not treat it as something that's sort of separate, right? So, how do you build upon um, students' interpersonal or intrapersonal 
skills within the math classroom, you know, not just something that is, you know, that's an after school program and what are, you know, learning mindsets and learning behaviors that you can integrate, you know, that are uh, content and subject specific. These are sort of some, some of the things that we've been slowly been working on and continue to work on um, and, and building teachers capacity to teach so, social emotional work for, for students. Um, and they are asking for support. I mean, they are communicating their need for that as well, right? They're not saying I need social emotional learning, but they're saying I'm, you know, burnt out, I'm burnt out, I'm tired, I'm this, that, you know. And so, so that's where we're responding to those kind of things that we're hearing. Um, and and again, it's not just our schools. A lot of this national data that's coming out is sort of corroborating some of those things that we're finding. So those, those are just sort of a handful. We're also knowing that you can't that leadership support is also very important, right? So we are working with. Um, the principals and superintendents to build the structures, the processes, the, the um, practices that, so that it becomes sort of a school-wide culture that supports uh, social emotional learning for students, for, for educators as well. Excellent. I think that is such an important piece of uh, what everyone <laughs> needs, a parent, children, uh, teachers, administrators, policy makers. Uh, right. you know, yeah. Um, so I'd like to move uh, back to Matt and to Karen and ask you how you're capturing or are, are you even thinking about, are you able to think about social emotional skills? And if so, um, are you thinking about how to capture um, progress being made in what I was just talking about, um, allowing teachers to feel more comfortable? teaching math in the context of uh, providing a uh, warm and supportive uh, environment for our students. However, our assessment doesn't obviously capture those kinds of critical foundational skills, but I will share that we're really hearing from our partners who are focused on recovery, the real critical nature of attending to the social and emotional needs of students. There's been this um, push, I mean, we showed some really dramatic data about the impacts on academic outcomes, but for teachers, what was first of mine, foremost of mine was getting students back reintegrated in the classroom and connected to each other, to their peers, remembering what it's like to be a learner and be in the classroom for the full day. That was really what was the most urgent need when students were re-entering the classroom. So I'm really glad that we're having this conversation and making sure that we're um, considering both perspectives. We can't just assume pop kids back in a classroom, put them in a seat, start delivering math instruction, and they're going to be ready to recover immediately. There are other unmet needs that need to be attended to in this moment, and they certainly build on one another in really critical ways. Wonderful, exactly. I concur <laughs> totally. Um, Matt, what about um, any interest? Yeah, I would, I would say we're in the same boat. Um, I mean, we do have um, we do have some data. We have a, especially in math, um, we have a, a product called Learning Games that includes a social emotional learning component to it. Um, but again, like I, I think that like Karen said, it's you know we don't have we don't have great data right now. We're trying to incorporate that more in, into what we do. Um, so I can't say a whole lot more than other than yes, we'd like to have more of that data. We just don't, we don't have direct access to those things, but like anything, like everybody's talking about, I mean, it's a systemic thing and just focusing on just student test outcomes is, is really kind of limiting and you really want to make sure you're having a, a, a full view. And again, not just at the student level, but also teachers and even administrator level. And then, you know, the larger, um, you know, the larger community around those schools and in those districts because that has a huge impact on what what's happening you know in the school but as well as you know what what students are coming to school with as well as what teachers are coming to school with yeah um let me stay with you for a minute um if that's true um and we don't really have any <clears throat> excuse me measure way to measure or to show teachers how how things are getting better climate wise um or, or limited maybe i should say um how can we help teachers focus on more than just the test scores? It's such, the numbers are so important. Uh, parents wanna know that their children are catching up, if you will. Um, everyone wants to know, that's the, the measure that people turn to, but that's not the only measure as we're acknowledging. How can we, how can you in your role help balance it? I think, I think a big part of it is that 
like I mentioned, there's a lot of data available for students. I mean, you know, folks that use the iReady system, folks that use MAP, you know, there's other tests out there that folks use. There's a lot of information about, you know, what students know and what they can do. Um, but, and sometimes, again, it's that idea of, you know, data rich information poor. So what do you do with those data? How do you kind of utilize those data to really put together a plan? And I think that, you know, a common theme is that, you know, having a, a, a explicit plan for moving forward, what are we going to do? It's targeted, right? Not just saying we're, everybody's going to do the same thing, but for this particular student, we know where the deficits are and these are the things that need to happen in order to get, get that student back to proficiency. Part of the guidance that I think you know, we give, as well as, as most folks give, it's again, it's not just what happens in the classroom, but we want teachers and we want, pe we want parents to be active participants in that student's plan, right? The more that there's that communication between teachers and students, how they can see their own data and kind of look at their own progress and have them be active participants in their own learning, as well as getting parents involved that's kind of a, a critical part of, of all this, you know, nothing happens in a vacuum. And again, I think making it more about we're in this together, I think my own opinion is, you know, given especially a lot of the animosity in, in a lot of places that if, if we can model a good cooperative relationship, like that'll, that'll really go a long way. I mean, we do have Teachers that, and again, I'll just speak for the teachers that use the iReady system, but there's there's actually a supplemental learning, there's some curriculum and other stuff. So we actually have a lot of data about what students are doing, when they take lessons, how long they take lessons. So you can get a sense, you know, you can kind of create some proxies for, um, you know, engagement. You know, are they, they've been averaging a certain number of, of um, you know, uh, minutes per week taking lessons is that increase is that decline if it's declined why is that if they start you know each lesson each supplemental lesson has a lesson quiz that goes along with it are there pass rates going down those kind of things so there is some information that teachers do have access to daily you know as soon as a student takes a lesson as soon as they you know do a a lesson quiz they get those reports they have that information available again it's just kind of putting that into a, into a format and putting it as part of a uh, explicit and deliberate plan moving forward to really address, you know, what, where those deficits are for those kids to really get them caught up. Mm. And it sounds like, as Fanat was saying, we also need to engage our leaders in making sure that that kind of culture is created in the school. So, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge, I'm just, I'm a huge fan of, you know, again, making sure that we're looking at the entire system and not just focusing on just students or just teachers or just, because it, again, nothing happens in a vacuum and all these things are interplaying and, you know, you know, understanding that and being able to take that into account that, you know, teachers aren't isolated in, in a classroom, right? There's, there's factors that impact what they do, how they do it, when they do it. Um, and, you know, trying to understand that. And again, I think it's part of our role is to make those data, you know, available as well as interpretable so folks can kind of, again, understand what are these relationships and, and how do these things work together? Because at the end of the day, we're all working towards, you know, what's going to get, get, get students improved, you know, get, getting students improved the fastest way, the best, the best way um, possible. Right. Helping our students, that's the goal. That's the goal. Well, and that leads me back, Karen, to some of the things that you were talking about. Thank you so much um, that you were talking about in terms of um, layering and stacking or the terms you used, which I loved um, some of uh, the interventions that we know have been um, helpful, tutoring, um, summer programs, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit more about how you might uh, recommend if you have recommendations or if you want to do that, um, how can leaders and teachers think about um, what needs to be done for students with those two interventions? I think that's a great question. And it very much is a local problem. We wouldn't want people to come away from these kinds of research presentations and assume what we're seeing nationally is reflective of their students. So the first starting place is to understand the local data to understand what are the needs of your students. And by having a really frank understanding of what student needs are, then we can be propelled to move and select the kinds of resources and supports that will help get students back to where they need to be. I think a really critical question in this moment is um, taking a hard look at the kinds of uh, systems we had in place before that were already producing inequities. And we don't wanna just double down and do more of what was already not working for a huge swath of our population of students. So it's being really attentive to what's working and using data both to understand student needs, but also monitor progress and understand who are we helping catch up, who is being left behind, and how can we make sure we're actually uh, meeting them where they're at and meeting their needs. 
So my hope is that in this moment where schools are really experiencing this influx of resources targeted at helping them get students back on track, they're using those dollars wisely to use evidence-based strategies and programs that um, suggest they will help their kids, but also not just assuming that they will work, right? We don't wanna just put a program in place, let it do its thing and hope, and you know, two years later that we'll see some impact. It needs to actually be a, a progress monitoring exercise where we're seeing the progress we want. And if not, we need to fail quickly, right? We need to say, this program doesn't seem to be working for these kids, so let's try something else. So, um, probably not surprising from someone that's a researcher and works at a company with a lot of data. I'm a data nerd and I'm always going to say this comes back to making sure we're using information to understand where kids are at and understanding whether we're having the impact that we need to. Excellent, excellent. <clears throat> and I also think, excuse me, that tutoring takes many different forms <laughs> and can be implemented in hundreds maybe of different ways and how to do that to fit the needs of the particular community I think is what you're saying also. And also it's going to take, um, we need to be realistic here about we already have a human capital problem in education as Fanat showed us that teachers are leaving at higher rates than in the past. So uh, relying on high dosage tutoring as the, the silver bullet that's going to get us out of this problem assumes that we've got this whole trained workforce of folks that are ready and willing to uh, deliver tutoring at the scale that we would need to get out of this problem. And that's probably drastically unrealistic. So uh, just there's a lot of moving parts here and we need to be mindful of what our capacities are to deliver services. Right. And how we start the development of that capacity, right? We don't have it now. How can we get there very quickly? I think mm -hmm. that's a huge issue. And that brings me to the whole question about uh, policy spending. And uh, if we're doing it, if we're spending money in the right ways, and if not, what would we recommend two school districts, um, and maybe I'll go back to uh, Fanat or Matt, do you want to take that? Um, I think Karen just explained that uh, it needs to be done. It needs to be done thoughtfully at the local level. Well, I think, you know, Karen brings up an important point about, you know, a high dosage tutoring can be a solution, but without the capacity to tutor, without enough staff to do that, it, it, it becomes a non-solution. And I think one of the one of the policies, I think we're looking, a lot of people are focusing on in-service and schools, but I think we also have to look at teacher prep um, um, to see where the solutions are. And some of the things that are that are being discussed are um, different modes for teacher prep. So for example, teacher residencies and as part of their clinical experience as student teachers. They can serve in schools as substitute teachers and paraprofessionals and tutors, right? For example, um, the you know sort of addressing some of the major issues with the teacher shortages and that, that teacher shortage isn't going to go away. Also, has so some of the solutions have to come um, from the path to teacher preparation, right? So things like you know apprenticeship. It's, it's really about making the profession more attractive. Obviously, increasing salary is, is critically important. Um, having um, other policy solutions that are being discussed are things like uh, apprenticeship models where uh, uh, student teachers, um, that, where teaching becomes an, an apprenticeship where they can actually, um, it's like an earn and learn model, right? As a way to sort of address some of the um, pending or the current and, and widening teacher and educator shortage. Um, yeah, some, those are some policy issues, but I'm just saying it's not enough to just look at what schools and districts do. I think you also have to look at teacher prep. Um, Absolutely. And developing the professional development capacity for the field. I think that's another field. huge issue that we haven't really addressed. And yeah, that, I, I would, I would also suggest that, because and, and Karen kind of mentioned this is, I think we have to resist the, 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 <laughs> the tendency to try to be overly prescriptive um, and especially when on, the, on the policy side, because in a lot of ways, this is very much, I mean, we, we talked about the average, but it's very much a, a local thing and, and how it impacted students locally is not necessarily the same as how on average across, you know, the entire country. And I think we have to be careful to 
keep that flexibility in whatever policy you know solution to come up with. There's a lot of money flowing around, and we and we do know that in some cases there's districts that are having trouble spending the money that they they've already been provided, given all these things. And again, like as Fanad said, and as Karen had mentioned too, I mean, there's lots of different factors at play. And so trying to come in with a, you know, again, a one size fits all kind of solution, which can can often happen in a lot of policy responses, can be difficult. I to me, this is like an unprecedented time because it really is one of those times, it, it really is kind of a, a almost a paradigm shift that, that we we talk a lot about. And you know, it was a, a cataclysmic, you know, problem hit everyone, didn't pick particular areas, it it hit all areas of, of education across the United States, across the world. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to see, you know, see what works, but don't necessarily just focus on, you know, well, this has had worked in the past. Well, maybe it has, but is it going to work in the, in, in the future? And again, I think just, to, I'm just going to say whatever Karen says I should do, but, you know, again, this idea that, you know, fail quickly, right. We have data and don't be afraid to try new stuff, but also don't be afraid to monitor. Don't be afraid to say, you know what, this didn't work. Now let's try something else. It's not going to happen in the course of a year. And again, I think taking the long view really helps to hopefully take some of the, um, you know, sting out of it doesn't work. There's definitely urgency and saying it's going to take multiple years doesn't mean it's not urgent, but it also means that, you know, it's okay to, you know, again, slow and steady wins the race. And, you know, as you try things out, you know, just keep monitoring and, and, and keep looking um, at those data that you do have access to. Yeah, I, I think I agree. I think we're at a crossroads and we can go back and either try to do the same old harder, faster in a more concentrated way or stop to be uh, reflective about this moment in time and think about, yes, the test scores are very important, but they're one measure and we need many more ways of thinking about uh, not just returning, but addressing some of those uh, yawning inequities that have only been exacerbated um, as a result of what happened. Well, I I would be, I think it'd be remiss too, to talk about like, you know, all the data that we're talking about are students that were actually tested. We know there's a large number of students that didn't come back to school, right? And we're not even kind of talking about, so there's, there is a fairly significant unknown. And again, I would suspect, I think we all suspect that a lot of those students are from those student populations that were typically at risk before the pandemic hit. So again, I mean, that's another interesting part of this. And we can only do data, we can only, you know, analyze data we have access to. We know there's a very significant chunk of students that did not test, like, you know, left the system and have not come back. And, you know, again, what are the longer term implications of that? And, you know, just getting those kids back into the school is, is, a, is a fairly significant issue for a lot of districts. Major problem, major problem. Absolutely, especially in our city schools. Yeah, uh, I think we've reached the end of our time. Um, I wanna thank each of you. You've done such a great job of um, explaining clearly uh, where we are, uh, what we still need to find out and um, you know the long road ahead. Um, I love the idea of providing a, uh, a rich way of looking at um, and a time to explore and try things and get even better um, at what we've always done quite well in America. Thank you so much. And Randy, back to you. That was a fantastic seminar. On behalf of the Forum for World Education, I'd like to thank John Meyer, Matt Boss, Karen Lewis, and Bernard Ackler for a really interesting and insightful webinar. And you, our audience, for your attendance. Please visit fweforum.org to find out more about FWE and its educational programming and to sign up for alerts for future events. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye.